Hey, good afternoon. Craig Cottle, director of Nature Line School, coming at you today. Yes, in the afternoon. I'm usually here in the mornings for my woods walks, but I had a writing deadline and I'm still under, but I told myself that I wasn't allowed to go to the woods this morning like I usually do unless I got an X amount of my writing done, which I did. So now I'm out at lunchtime instead of morning time. It's good to be here. Um, it's, it's a good thing to go to a wooded area, uh, natural area that you frequent and do it at different times of the day. You'll see different things. You'll hear different things. You'll smell different things. So highly recommend it. Two big topics for you today. It's spring and it's warm enough that a lot of people are starting to get in out, get out here in the central part of the country. And our friends down south have been doing this for probably two or three weeks minimum. And our friends in the north will be doing it soon enough. So the big thing that always comes up it are ticks and snakes. And so let's talk about both. What I want to do is I want to look at on both topics. I want to, I want to look at avoidance and prevention first and foremost. Number two, I want to look at how to handle yourself if you, you haven't done step one and now you have to deal with these things. Okay. So let's talk about ticks first. Avoidance and prevention goes like this. Ticks. Well, I should say this first. Here's where I get my information from. I did a, a bunch of programming for the Department of Defense several years ago. And one of the things that was so beneficial, tracker. We're going this way, buddy. He runs right at me, scares me to death like he's gonna take my knee out. Um, one of the benefits of doing those things is they had experts in various fields come in and speak to the participants in the programming. And one year there was an entomologist there that was there to do nothing but talk about ticks. This is a guy that spent like 30 years studying ticks. <clears throat> so I'll dwindle what I learned from him into real concise information. Avoidance, stay away from moisture. Okay. So ticks have to have a certain amount of moisture to survive. They don't do very well at all if they don't have moisture. So if you're going into areas like a wooded area or a natural area, then going in the mornings, for example, when the dew's still on and the ticks are there and they're lively and active in the springtime, because that's when they're on the move more so than the winter, you're more likely to get ticks on you. And and if you weren't aware, ticks are around all the time, okay? It's just in the winter time, they're primarily not as active. They're not dormant at all. They're just not as active. Now they're trying to hitchhike and move around and do the things that ticks do. <laughs> so uh, they're using the spring and the moisture to be able to do that. And this area right here, as I'm walking on it, is a good example. You'll see this area right here. There's water that runs off this hill. It stands on this road and uh, this field that you see over here almost always is wet. And because of that, there's a lot of things that happen here. There's a lot of really nice edibles in the springtime there that I like to check out. There's almost always deer and other animals right along that creek that runs over there. Uh, morels grow right along that creek. So I'm down uh, in the springtime when ticks are out, I'm in this area a lot. And so there will not be a time that I go through here that I don't get ticks on me. Um, but the reason for that is that I am going where they are. And so I could avoid that altogether. I could avoid that, but my life doesn't allow me to do that. Okay. Now, the other thing that I do that works exceptionally well and this researcher I mentioned earlier spoke of this highly was permethrin. Is it permethrin or permethrin? I can't remember. Either way, uh, Sawyer brand is what I get. It's the stuff that comes in the big yellow bottle. You don't want to put that on your skin, but you do want to put it on your clothes. And it works best if you put it on prior to an event, meaning 
it's not like DEET where you get out of the vehicle and you spray yourself down. If you know you're gonna go out, then spray your clothes down the day before. Let it dry and soak into the clothing and that'll help you tremendously. Um, that's one of the biggest things that I see people missing is uh, they just spray themselves down as if it's DEET. It doesn't work the same way. This way, pup. Come on. Watch him run. Good boy. Um, that works exceptionally well. Uh, I pulled five ticks off of me in the last two weeks. That's because I haven't put my clothes, haven't put permethrin on my clothes. What I usually do is I'll have a couple of pair of pants that I rotate through that literally are pants that all I use them for is to go out into the woods in. And so I try to keep one of them clean. I'm pretty dirty out here. I get down on the ground a lot, particularly with tracks and studying plants and stuff. So I go through those pants pretty quick, quickly, but I set those aside so that I know I've always got a pair of pants that I can put on before I go to the outdoors. And I usually have an overshirt as well. And that just helps to keep the ticks off of me. And it works really well. Permethrin does. So pick that up. You can get that at Walmart, big box stores, Amazon, wherever. It's good stuff. Now, if you get a tick on you, then there's a lot of good information out there about ticks. Uh, reach down, get it so that when you pull the tick off, you pull the head off with it and you don't leave anything behind. Um, it's one of the reasons I do like having a magnifying glass in my kit, not for fire starting, but to see things like that, ticks, insects, inside the wound of a cut or something, make sure I'm getting everything out of it. Um, so I, I really hope that helps you. That's primarily what you can do for ticks. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you that uh, I have had Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, let, me, let me put a, a star by the Lyme disease. What happened is we, my family, when our kids were younger, we got like 200 ticks on us each. It's crazy. We got into an infestation of them one spring out hiking. And instead of waiting for lab results our doc simply gave us antibiotics and so even though we tested later for having the is the right word antibodies for um, Lyme disease we never experienced any ill effects that we're aware of that we are aware of the Rocky Mountain spotted fever just about killed me literally uh, not figuratively at all literally um, pretty much the thing that saved me from having pretty serious organ damage or death was my wife being very, very direct with the doctor because you can imagine a lot of people say that they've had a tick bite to a doc and they, you know, people are scared to death of them. And this doctor just could not understand that I'm in the woods every day. And so he didn't want to. He just couldn't understand that. And so, and I, quite frankly, was unable to communicate effectively at the time. I was curled up in the fetal position and literally thought I was in the process of dying. It was bad. But Jennifer was really direct saying and telling the doc what it was I did for a living. And so that helped get the test for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which it showed that I, that I had it. Again went through an antibiotic cycle and as far as i know i mean i don't i'm not the perfect epitome of health but as far as we know i haven't had any things that have occurred because of either of those two diseases for me that does i don't want to use i don't want you to use that as an encouragement to go out and not worry about it you should because it's a killer if it's not taken care of properly okay now on the snake bites there's a whole lot of crap out there about snake bites. Uh, nearly everything is, is garbage. And my source for the information I'm about to share 
is Mr. Jim Harrison, who is the uh, the gentleman that runs the Kentucky Reptile Zoo. He and his wife, Kristen, run the Kentucky Reptile Zoo in Slade, Kentucky, where they gather snake venom for medical research. And <clears throat> uh, I interviewed Jim a number of years ago. It was a great interview as far as the information. Jim did a fantastic job as he's very well educated and experienced on the subject matter. My job as the videographer and the and the audio person sucked. So I, I almost feel bad putting it out there because Jim's the type of guy that's been on Discovery Channel and all sorts of places and he just deserves better than the quality that I could provide him. But he and I are friends. Um, we've done some martial arts training together. So he, he indulged me on the interview. With all that said, uh, I'll share that video below. Just realize the quality is not that good. And, and I want to apologize to Jim if he's aware that this is still going on out there. Okay. Because uh, of the quality of that video. But the information, again, is solid. The only thing that works for snake bite is a set of car keys. That's it, you all. That's it. Go to the hospital. Uh, you do not have the means at home to do anything to make that situation any better after you have been bitten. There's two things that are happening there when you get bit by a snake, and there is the spreading of the venom and the bonding of the venom. And both of them are things that you really don't have anything you can do, okay? So let's talk about some of these myths and let's talk about why they're problematic. First off, snake bite kits. The bonding agent with inside a snake venom bonds in a couple of different ways, but, and it passes primarily through the lymphatic system of the body. There's just not much you can do about it, you all. Uh, so you cannot, with snake venom or kerosene, which is a real old, um, what is it, uh, folk medicine way of extracting venom from the body, put kerosene on a wound site. Uh, both of those things are garbage. Neither one of them work because of the way the venom bonds inside the body. Um, back in the day, somebody got bit by a snake. They put kerosene on it, and this amber-colored stuff came to the surface. They assumed that that was snake venom, and the person had no ill effects. And so the message got spread, put kerosene on it. Well, this is what happens with a, a lot of things with something like folk medicine, which is the person was going to be fine without it to begin with. And the kerosene really didn't do anything at all anyway. Whatever the, there could be just the normal fluids that surround a, an open wound on your body that came out. It wasn't the venom at all. Same thing is true for uh, Sawyer snake bite kits. You literally cannot extract the snake venom from the body. You just can't. It doesn't work that way. It bonds to the body and you cannot pull it out. Okay. Beyond that, tourniquet use. Tourniquet use or ice are both designed to slow down the process of uh, venom passing through the body. And it does not work that way. That does not happen. What it does force to happen is the snake venom to go deeper into the tissues of the body instead of just on the surface, which is gonna cause a much more uh, dangerous injury to the body. Therefore, tourniquet use, ice, are poor choices to put on a snake bite. What's the solution? Car keys. Get to a hospital. So again, can't remember that professor's name. He was a, you know, a PhD in ticks, some sort of entomologist, right? From UK who talked to me about ticks. Jim Harrison, who has literally a lifetime of uh, academic study and experience with snake venom. Um, he's the one that shared the information on snakes. I, I'm so, yeah, I say this all the time and people, I mean, I come off with a video like this and I sound like I know what I'm talking about. It's only because I stand on the shoulders of giants, you all. And I would recommend that you do the same, is look to people who have lots of information, lots of experience and knowledge on subject matter, 
spend time with them, ask them questions, and then you can move off a better person for it. So any credit here that might come from this video is not about me, it's about somebody else that's given the information to me. So you have skills like that too, share them with others. And if you find this information useful, then please share it with the people in your hiking groups, in your outdoor groups and what have you, because it's vital. A lot of people are getting out. Oh, I didn't talk about prevention with snakes. Okay, first off, snakes are gonna do everything they can to avoid you. So don't be sticking your hands up underneath logs, inside of rocks. Don't be crawling back into caves or shelters or anything of that nature where snakes utilize those areas for homes and bedding sites, okay? And um, if you suffer from SPS, you might want to pick up a snake. And if, if by suffering for SPS, you pick up a snake, um, that's on you. Huh? They don't know what SPS means? Small penis syndrome. So if you've got a small penis and you have to pick up a snake to show everybody how cool you are. <laughs> Do you like that SPS? Just leave it alone, you all. One of the things that I've said for years that is a benefit for me is, is if I see a snake and I wanna study it, I keep a monocular in my chest kit, a little small one, and it helps me do a lot of things out here. I'll give you a perfect example. If I don't wanna crawl over in that crap, because I, I think I might see a morel over there, but over there's where all the ticks are, then I'm gonna sit right here with my monocular and I'm gonna scan that environment. Don't get ticks on me. Still see up close and personal what's going on over there. Same thing with snakes. If I wanna study a snake and see if it's got a circle pupil or a, a line, I'm gonna look at it right here with my monocular from a distance. Okay, so keep that in mind. What I'm gonna do is I'm also gonna put up the link to the the video with Jim, that way you can watch him and speak because he talks about the statistical data and stuff to go along with it. And again, I apologize to Jim and, and to you, my favorite viewer of said videos because the quality is poor and that's long before I had the much better technology that I have now. All right, I think that's it, you all. As always, come on, join in. Let's learn together. Hey everybody, thanks for watching the video. If you want to stay connected, do this. Check out the website, naturereliance.org. That's naturereliance.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page, join our newsletter. That's where we do all the giveaways. That's where we do all the discounts. That's where we do all the cool stuff for all the cool kids. You'll want to be part of it. Come on, join in. Let's learn together.